right. Well, I'll tell you what. It is uh, my uh, tremendous privilege and honor uh, to introduce our guest to you who's going to get us kicked off here for 2022 Global Outreach. Um, Ricky has become a great friend of ours. Uh, many of you know he's working down in the D.C. area, uh, formerly played for uh, the NFL had an illustrious career, and his rookie card is worth millions of dollars if you can get your hands on one. Um, but we are so glad to have him. Um, he's a delight for you to listen to, and I can tell you, uh, to be able to have uh, any opportunity to kind of, you know, spend some time with him afterwards is wonderful as well. And so, uh, so glad he's going to be here tonight for the barbecue. I want to encourage you again to come out to that. But do me a favor, give a warm welcome to Ricky Bolden. Thank you, Pastor. Wow. I just love this setup. It is awesome. You know, I, it is such a joy for me to be here today. And I'm going to tell you, I cannot wait for 8.30 tonight on ESPN, the Boston Celtics will be playing. Amen, amen. And I'm telling you, I was so frustrated the other night when they blew it at home. And so anyway, I'm still recovering from that. I want to first of all just say what a joy it is to see Pastor Josh. Because, of, amen. To see his growth, to see him maturing in the office that God has called him, I, every time when I see him, I am just so excited. And it, only God can do that, right? Amen, amen. When he came here, probably a lot of you said, ah, he'll never be the pastor of the church. And now to see what God is doing through him, right? It is so good to see God use him in such a great way. Well, I have another thing I wanted to tell you real briefly. Amen, amen, I know. Uh, another thing briefly I want to say. Um, I want to thank you because you all did something for me this year that had never been done before in my life. And, you know, most of the time people call me to give to them. And this year around, around Christmas, someone emailed me and says, you know, they asked me about five or six questions. And one of the questions is, if you could do one thing, what would you do? And so I thought I would simply be transparent and say, I would go out and spend the night in a hotel with my wife. And I, and I sent that back. Well, in February, I get an email, and it says, Curtis Lake Church, would like to send you away for a night in a hotel with you and your wife. Now, amen, amen, amen. Now, a lot of times what we don't see is we don't see the other side of the picture. My wife is a nurse, and at, and at 58 years old, she decided to go back to nursing school, get her nursing degree, and right at the beginning of the pandemic, she went to work as a nurse. And nurses work crazy hours. I, I, like my wife will leave at 6 o'clock in the morning and come home at 9 o'clock at night. And so we just, we were just disjointed. And because you all took care of us and served us so well, we were able to get reconnected. And I, I'm telling you, Curtis Lake, I want to thank you for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. I also, I also, you know, I, got, I keep looking at my watch, and I don't know why, because I'm going to go as long as I want to go anyway. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, and it, I also want to say what a joy it is to be a ministry partner with you. It has been such a joy. Uh, your team has loved us well. They have served us well. And if you can see me and my brothers, we all walk together. It is, God is doing some great and amazing things in Washington, D.C., and I would just love to talk to you about it, you know, because I'm going to be here until Thursday. I have a, I have a suite uh, at the Howard Johnson that I'm staying in. Amen. That's not true. You don't have one here. But it's like the Howard Johnson. And I am having, so I'll be here all week, and if you have any questions, please ask me. I would love to share with you, okay? Well, why don't I, uh, and, and, th and then the last part is, you know every once in a while you're going to have to say amen. 
Oh, Lord. Uh -oh. I got to work with Josh. He's got to get more amens out of you than that. Is that all right? Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's get started. So I had the, one of the most challenging weeks this past week as a pastor. And, 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 and really just trying to get in and wrestle in God's word to say, God, what is it that you want me to say? Now, here is the problem that I had. On the one hand, I was reading this beautiful text that they gave me in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 4, and it's right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you know when you read the Sermon on the Mount, it is crazy. It's like, man, Jesus raised the standard up by 50. And so I'm reading this passage, but I'm also processing my life situation. On one hand, I've got the orthodoxy. That means what I should believe. But on the other hand, I'm struggling with orthopraxy. How do I practice and live out what I have encountered in Scripture? That was a tension to me. And I'm like, I'm not doing what this text is saying. Now, now, as I sat back and I began to assess, why am I not doing what this text is saying? You know, it's a real logical answer. It's because people that I trusted so much, they didn't encourage me to do it. People that I, I learned from and people that had, I was committed to, people that shaped my life, they didn't emphasize it. They didn't. When I first got drafted to the NFL, I didn't know how to use money. I didn't know how to spend money. And I started going to other places to learn how to spend money. And so back, back then, it was this ministry called Crown Ministry. And it was a ministry about money management. I studied that, and they gave me some great advice. Then I started reading Dave Ramsey, and I studied Dave Ramsey. And Dave Ramsey gave me a lot of real good advice. But the reality is, they never taught me this. Because when I looked at the scripture, the scripture told me it was saying something differently. Is it okay if I read it to you real quick? Can I read it to you? Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. I'm trying to help you. Amen. Amen. So, 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 so I studied Dave Ramsey, and I, I, I've been through Crown Ministries, and I just really thought I had this part. And then all of a sudden, I get to this. Now, now, now you got to interpret this on your own. Don't ask your spouses or anything. Listen to what it says. It, right here. Now, I'm preaching today from, from, from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I read the entire chapter of Matthew and so in verse, in verse 19 through 21, which is like a bookend to this section, it, 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 it gives another verse. Listen to what it says. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Did you get that? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Oh! Woo! I said, wow. No, 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 no. Listen to it. Just, no, no. Listen to it. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Ah, oh, that's what I've been doing all my life. That's what Dave Ramsey taught me to do. Make sure you set your retirement up real nice so that, so that, your, so that your style of living won't ever change. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. I had to make sure that I had good retirement. And so I got me a 401k, I, I got annuities and all these funds, and, there, and then I started laying them up. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I tell you something I did? You're going to probably, you know, when I was playing in the NFL, the, uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. They give us playoff money. 
and the playoff money is over and above your salary. So, let, so, so, so I played in the, in, in, in the mid-'80s, and so let's say my salary was $350,000. Now, that is nothing compared to what it is now. So let's say my salary is $350,000, and, and that was one of my salaries uh, when I was in the NFL. So all of a sudden, I go, and, and, and I go to this guy from Merrill Lynch, and I said, so what should I do? He said, Rick, you should, you should take that playoff money and put it in, a, in an annuity. I said, well, that's pretty good advice. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. And so I went and I took this. And so, so I'm going to tell you how the playoffs work. Back when I played, now I'm talking 30 years ago. You know, the first game, if you went to the wild card game, they'll pay each player $6,000. Now you multiply that by five, and that's what they make today. But then if you win that game, you go to the, you, you go to the division championship game, then they move from $6,000 to $10,000. And I'm like, woo, because I'm from the hood. They never had that kind of money, right? It's like, woo, hoo, hoo, 10 grand, over and above my salary. But then if you win that game, you go to the next game, and that game was $18,000. Can you imagine that? And then, <laughs> I feel your pain. I feel your pain. I do feel your pain. And then, and then from that game, from that game, then the next game is the Super Bowl, which was $36,000. Now, we never went to the Super Bowl, but we went to the AFC Championship three years ago, three years in a row, which was the $18,000 game. And my, my advisor says, just put it into annuity. You'll take care of your college. You'll take care of your kids in college, Ricky. You'll pay, be able to pay for their college. And I said, that's a good idea. And every year we went to the playoffs, guess what I did? I laid up for myself treasures on earth. Ah! And you wouldn't believe every last one of my kids went to college on that fund. There was so much money, amen, amen, that's good, amen, amen, bless the Lord. There was still money left in that fund. And my wife went back to nursing school and graduated from college. And you know what? There's still a lot of money in that fund. And I'm looking at this scripture as a pastor, as a person who say, I love Jesus, and this passage is saying, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. And so now, you see what I mean? I'm trapped in my orthodoxy, what, what I'm reading and what I'm studying. I'm trapped between my orthodoxy and my orthopraxy. God, what is it that you want me to do? <sighs> That's what I want to teach about today. I want to come in and say, Okay, Dave Ramsey did a great job, but maybe he didn't reveal everything. Maybe he did not reveal, reveal the mind of Jesus. Maybe, maybe Crown Ministry did a great job. You know, we did the envelope system. We did it all. But maybe, but maybe he didn't teach us everything that Jesus taught us. And so, amen. So if you can, can you give me about 20 minutes? Amen. Okay, so in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you one of the quickest renditions of why. Now, the first problem, I think, that the reason why people, you know, really get trapped into this, how much do we save? How much do we give to our children? See, we're laying up all this stuff. I need to have all of these emergency funds, and I've got to have a car fund and a refrigerator fund, an air condition fund, a heating fund, and we've got all this money stored away. But there's so many people in need that never, ever will be blessed by what we have stored away. That's the point. And so here's a question that Jesus is asking. I did not create you to store up wealth. I did not create you to, to all these accounts to store money and dollars and all of these, and all of these needs are in the world. 
that you've got all this stuff that you're living on easy street and you're saying, man, I'm going to live better and better and better. But the reality is the text still say, lay not up for yourselves. Treasures on earth. You still got to deal with that. And so what I want to do is I'm going to take a second. I want to, I want to talk about like, like how, what I was taught traditionally as a giver. And then, and, then, and then this term I'm going to use this morning called generosity. How can we just be generous? God didn't call, he didn't call us to hoard. Jesus never said anywhere in the scriptures to hoard. He says, if people are ever going to experience generosity, they've got to experience it through us. And so, and so let me talk to you a little bit about, about me. So first of all, when I first came to the Lord, you know, people taught me about giving. I gave, man. I, you know, let me, and, and, and some of you might remember this. Preachers knew how to put you on a guilt trip to give, didn't they? Listen, I'm, I'm going to read one of the typical verses of giving that when I grew up. I mean, listen to this. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. And I mean, this verse used to drive me crazy. Here it is. Will a man rob God? Y'all remember that? No, no, that's what they would read. They would read this every week before the offering. Will a man rob God? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and in offering. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's what, that's what they used to read to us. And so we go to church, and, and I'm sitting here thinking, man, if I give my 10% to the Lord, God is going to open the floodgates of heaven. And he's going to pour out a blessing. And it's going to be so many blessings. I'm not going to have room enough to receive it. Can you imagine that? They would read that all the time. And then this is what they'd say. Really, the Lord is so good. He's going to give you 10%. Or he's going to ask for 10%. You keep the 90% for yourself. And you can do what you want to do with the 90%. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty good deal. So when I gave my life to the Lord, I mean 10%, I'm like, shoot, I'm giving 50% to the government. I might as well get the Lord 10%. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a pretty good little deal. And so, and, so, and, so, and so I gave my 10%. And I just took the mentality that everything else was to be used for the Lord or used for me. 10%, I could buy whatever car I wanted to buy. 10%, I give him 10%, I can buy the house I wanted to buy. 10%, I can buy the clothes I wanted to buy. I can go out with girls. I can do whatever I wanted to do. Just give God 10% and it's over because 90% is mine. Jesus steps on the scene. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus says, I'm not interested in that mentality. You, get, you give God 10%, you get 90%. I'm not, that, is not my, that was not the Sermon on the Mount's mentality. Jesus, let me, let me tell you what Jesus, what his mentality was. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. 100% belongs to me. That's Jesus' mentality. You get everything that you get from the Lord. Every penny you make, every dime you have, it all comes from God. God has been good to all of us, and so therefore, based upon God's goodness, God's been so good to you, he gave 100%. He gave his one and only son, and because God gave so much to you, then certainly you can give everything for him. That, that's his mindset. Man, I thank you so much, sis. That, that's his word. See, that's generosity. Generosity steps over here and says it all belongs to God. Giving says 10% belongs to God. And some people will live into this 10% for the rest of their lives, and that's okay. But what I'm challenging you to do is say, how do, you, how do we be generous? How do we? I mean, I mean, if you look at the scriptures, Jesus honored people who were generous. You remember when the man walks up to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus says? Sell everything that you have and come and follow me. You know what the guy said? I can't do it. He walked away. Jesus wasn't talking about 10%. He was talking about everything. 
You remember when Zacchaeus, he walks up and he says, and Jesus comes to his house and have dinner. You know, Zacchaeus, he didn't say, Jesus, I'm going to give 10% of everything I have to the poor. No, he says, I'm going to give 40%. That's generosity. You remember when, the, when Jesus was sitting in, in front of, in the church service in the synagogue and, and he saw two people give and he saw one guy come in and he had $100 bills and he dropped some of the hundreds. He was a Pharisee. He dropped out these $100 bills and it looked all impressive. And then this one woman came up and she had all, she, she, she had just one mite. That's all she had. And she dropped the one mite. And you know, Jesus looked back, you know what he said? That woman, she gave everything. These guys are just showboats. It's not, about, it's not about giving out of your wealth. So if you're wealthy, don't feel good because you give $1,000 when you're worth a half a million dollars. Don't showboat in front of me. He said, this woman has done the giving. She's got nothing else left. She gave everything. And even if you follow the, New Test the, the book of Acts in the New Testament, you see people selling land. Are you be wondering, why did the church work so well? Because God, like Barnabas in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 through 38, it says that he had owned a piece of property and there were others, Sapphira and Ananias, but they lied to the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit killed them. But anyway, <laughs> but, but they had all of this wealth. And you know what? They were generous. And so, you know, when I came in here today, as I prayed this week, I said, I don't want to come in and talk about, oh, you should support, you should support your partners. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about supporting a partner. I'm saying, what if we all lived lives of generosity? There are some of us that have bank accounts, and it may not be that big, but there's still more that we know that we need. Because what Jesus' mindset was, he says it in the Lord's Prayer. You remember what he says? How, because some of you are sitting here thinking, well, Rika, how do you expect me to live? You know how Jesus would expect you to live? Just re remember the Lord's Prayer when he says, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, give us, he, he, Jesus didn't say, give me this day my retirement. He said, give us this day. Jesus expected us every day of our lives, moment by moment, minute by minute, to trust God in such a way that we trusted him to provide for us all of our lives. And what we rob God of is trusting him to provide for us because we're trying to do it all for ourselves. Jesus is saying, guys, when are you going to trust me to take care of it? When are you going to trust me with your future? When are you going to trust me with the resources? You don't have to take care of that because I give you resources to bless other people. But you're hoarding them all just so that you can go and pad your future. That is not right. It, uh, lay that up for yourselves. Treasures, can you see my tension? Amen. Come on. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, it's so funny because I, I see two young ladies here and there. They're right here with me. Older folk are kind of like scratching their heads. You know why? Because they've got treasures, <laughs> and they've laid them up. Young people are like, hey, we broke, so we might as well trust Jesus anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, man. See, when you were young, you did the same thing. You trusted him. But now that you've got these bank accounts, it's hard to go. So anyway, let me hear up and get out of here. Hey, man, hey, man. come on. I got about 13 minutes, and I'm going to be out of here. Let me hear up and get out of here. So anyway, so let me tell you my passage, and then once I tell you, that took way too long for me to say, so I got to really hurry up. So, so I'm preaching, on, uh, you know, the first four verses in the sixth chapter. The sixth chapter is a, is a it, it really, the entire sixth chapter, it is broken down so well. So Jesus, he's writing this book, he, he's writing this part of the sermon to what he considers mature believers. And so he's talking about some moral practices that each mature believer should be participating in. Well, the first is giving. The second moral practice that you should be participating in is prayer. He teaches a section on prayer. So, so he teaches on giving, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. But in verses 5 through 14, he teaches it on prayer. And then from 16 through 18, he teaches on fasting. And every section, this is what he said, so when you give, so when you pray, so when you fast. See, he is anticipating that you're already doing these things. 
He is anticipating that spiritually you, your life is, is pretty well together. And so Jesus in the first four verses, and I'm going to read them in Arab and give you three principles so I can get out of here. Uh, so anyway, here, here, so Jesus says, I want you to think differently about giving. I want you to look at giving from a very, from a, from a brand new perspective. And so, so this is what he says here, right here about giving. He says in verse one, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, hear it? So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets. To be honored by others, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that, your, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Ah, amen. Isn't that good? Oh, Lord, thank you so much. You can give the Lord a hand for that. So notice he said when you give twice. He didn't say when you, he said, first of all, he says, so when you give, then he says, but when you give. He said it twice in verse 2, at the beginning of verse 2 and verse 3. So the good part about that is Jesus expects all of us to be generous. That's what he does. He is expecting every last one of us to be generous. Notice what he did not say. He did not say, so if you give. He didn't say that. He did not say, if you decide to give. He did not say that. Jesus says, so when you give. And so I, I came up with a point for that. Let me tell you what I wrote down for a point. I said, this will be a real good point right, right there for them to hear. Listen to what this first point is, and, and, and you're going to be blessed by this. I said that the, the, the first point that I want to give you today, oh, here it is. I put generous givers are intentional and seek to bless others. Oh, isn't that good? That's the first point. You're intentional and you seek to bless others. That Jesus, when he says, do not store up for yourselves, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, he is saying, well, you got to do something with your treasures. And so he is seeking for, he is, he is depending upon us to be looking for people to be blessed, to be thinking about people who are blessed. And I'm telling you, when you can shift your paradigm from giving to generosity to say, God, now I'm going to be seeking people to be blessed, God is going to turn your life upside down. Let me give you an example. One of the greatest, one of the greatest thing, disciplines I practice in my life is that when I wake up in the morning, I ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do today, Lord? It's a great discipline. Who do you want me to meet? I'm asking that question all the time of the Lord. And you know, it's amazing how God, he always comes through. I remember about maybe three or four months ago, I woke up. It doesn't happen all the time this pretty. But the Lord, you know, I was praying. I was like, Lord, would you just put the right person in my life today that I can bless? That's what I said. I said, Lord, would you just allow that person to be so clear I'm going to know that, Lord, you want me to share resources. And I prayed. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm sitting there on, and I'm trying to get things done and I'm writing my to-do list. And suddenly the Lord says, you need to go to the grocery store. Well, I said, oh, no, Lord, I don't need to go to the grocery store. I got plenty of groceries. I mean, you could tell the last thing I need is a grocery store. Amen. 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 But the Lord spoke to my heart, you need to go to the grocery store. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll put that down. And I said, I'll drop my clothes off at the cleaners, run through the grocery store. And so I'm running. And so I get to the grocery store, and I see all the people I normally see. I walk by, and there's a guy. It's a, you know, I was going by the Safeway, and there was a guy who's homeless. He's always there in front of the door. And every time I walk by, I try to give him a dollar. I say, hey, bro, here's a dollar. Because he always asks for change, and I keep telling him. I said, son, you're going to be out of business soon because... People don't carry change no more. They carry cards. And so I said, you're going to have to get you one of those credit card deals where you can slide it in 
and then have it go to your GoFundMe page or something. I said, but you got to think of a new, you're going to need something new because, but I always give them a dollar. And so I walk by and say, hey, here's your dollar. And I walk by and I get bump fist with the security guard. And so I go up and guess what the first aisle I go through? It is the sweet aisle. That's what they have in all Safeways. First thing you encounter are the sweet aisle. And I just I had to rebuke the fat demon because, amen, amen, amen. Anybody struggle with the fat demon? I mean, because... You want those cupcakes and all that? So I go by the cupcake aisle, and I'm going up and down. And so I'm almost out of the store, and I'm over with the fruit. And I said, Lord, you know what? You brought me to this store, and there's nothing here, a big zero. So I go up and grab me fruit, some fruit, and I set my fruit up. Hey, Amen. Tell them I said hello. Uh, but, anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, I grab me some fruit. And I, and I get my fruit, and I go up, and I get in line. Now, in a safe way, they have these social distances, and you know, they, had, they had these social distancing laws where you had to be six feet apart. And so I let the lady, so I, when I got in line, I, was, I said to myself, Lord, I got in the wrong line. And so I'm saying, because this lady's got a basket full of food. It's going to probably take 30 minutes just to run up all of her food. And I, I only have a few items, so I said, well, you know, I'm just going to stay here. And so I'm going up. And so the checker starts going through the lady's food and checking her out. I'm standing here, so this line behind me is getting longer. And so I'm sitting here, and so all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit just nudged me. Hone in and listen. And so I said, okay. And so when the lady ring this lady's bell up, it was like $176. So the lady, she looks at the, at the, at the, at the lady on the cashier, and she starts putting things back. And the Holy Spirit just choked my heart. And so I'm telling you, this happened. She put, so she said, I put this back, and, so, and I put this back. And then so, so she says, I put this back. And I'm standing here. So the guy behind me, you wouldn't have believed, I started to punch him. He's standing back there. She knew she didn't have no money to pay for all that stuff in the first. He's complaining. I was just, you know, a righteous anger. I was like, Doc, chill out. And my heart is weeping. And so the Holy Spirit said, okay, now this is what I called you here for. So I just leaned over to the cashier and I said, ma'am, could you do me a favor? She said, what? I said, uh, could, you just, could you just ring up my three items and just I'll take care of all of it. And the lady, she said, really? I said, yeah, don't, don't, just chill. Take a chill. Don't get excited. Just put my three items on her bill. And so, and so she, she, put my fruit on, she put my fruit on her bill. And I pulled out my credit card, and I just slipped it over to the side. And the lady was like, and so she told the lady, she said, ma'am, you don't have to put anything back. She said, just take all your groceries, and you can go. And the lady said, oh, no, 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 no. And she said, no, ma'am, just take all your groceries and go. And man, this, this lady, you should have seen. She said, really? Are you serious? She said, yeah. And so she put the rest. It's a single mom. The little lady's a single mom, you know, struggling. And so she put her store, her groceries in her store, in, in her basket. And she's just walking out, and you could just see the joy. And as I sat there and looked at her, it was probably one of the most emotional moments of my life. And I said, God, thank you so much for giving me the privilege a blessing someone. Lord, thank you for the privilege. I wouldn't have passed it up for nothing. It was such an honor and such a joy to see this woman walk out. And let me tell you, man, when, when that happened, you know, I just kind of disappeared in the winds, and I didn't go back to the Safeway for a couple of weeks. And when I went back, I saw the same telling. She said, I've been waiting for you to come back through my line. And I said, why? I said, why you been waiting on me to come back? Because I had forgotten about it. And she said, I get so many people who come, and they don't have the resources to pay for their food. And what the Holy Spirit says, I know, because their resources are laid up. They're laid up in their bank accounts, and people can't eat. They're laid up in car funds to be bought cars that they don't even have. They're laid up in stock markets. They laid up, they're laid up in IRAs. That we're so busy laying up treasures. And there are so many people that are out here that desperately desire 
to be blessed in this world. And that's why Jesus says, when you give, he is expecting that we're not going to be laying up resources, but that we're going to be generous and that we're going to be looking for opportunities to bless people, that we're going to be looking for ministries and we're going to be looking for places that we can surrender it all to the Lord. When you give, that's what he's asking us. And just imagine, Curtis Lake, just imagine if we can just get half of us to take serious this wonderful sermon, to say, God, we're going to be generous. We're going to be strategic. And, Lord, we're going to be intentional about looking for people to bless. There are young people in our schools that are begging to be blessed. There are people who can't pay rent. They're begging to be blessed. What if you went to your pastor, Pastor Josh, and say, listen, Pastor Josh, I've got some extra resources. And if someone comes here in need, I want to make sure that I'm a vessel that God can call on to use. Just imagine what it would look like if this became a church of blessing other people. I was just dreaming here about Curtis Lake. You know, I got to confess to you, I dream about you all the time, right? No, no, that's true, because, because what I do is I'm dreaming that what if this church could become the church that God really wanted it to be? And imagine, imagine Pastor Josh walking down the street, and they say, well, who are you? And he said, well, I'm the pastor of Curtis Lake. And they said, really? My kid needed shoes. And there was a person in Curtis Lake that blessed him. And you know what, a week later, I was hungry, and I went by fast food, and, and the person in the car for me, they, I looked at a bumper sticker, and it said, they're from Curtis Lake. And then, and, then, and then here it is. I ran out of gas. Guess who pulled over? Someone for Curtis Lake, and they filled my tank up. That everywhere you went here, there were people who said, God, I've been called to be generous, that I'm not going to believe the lie of laying up for myself, but that I'm going to bless people in this world. God loves the world, and that's what he's called you here for. Thank you so much. That's my young people. Thank you so much. He's called us here to respond to the needy. When you give, but listen, I got to hurry up. I'm almost out of time. Listen, I got to give you, uh, I may not be able to make it through the message this morning, so you may have to stay for the second service. But listen, <laughs> but Jesus gives one of the greatest, he gives one of the greatest principles. Because you know what? I understand when we have resources, how hard it is to get rid of it. I understand when you've worked all your life. Like uh, my wife, I told my wife, we have an account with a tremendous amount of money in it, what I think is a tremendous amount of money in any way. And I said, I think we should cash it in and give it away. My wife looked at me and said, are you crazy? And I said, yes, I am crazy. Thank you all so much. for hit. See, that's my hint that it's almost time. She, she said, are you crazy? And I said, yes, I am crazy. I think we should, we got to stop hoarding. That's all we're doing. It's hard for it to make that step. Just as it's hard for you to make the step. The only way you can make the step is that you surrender it to the Lord. That you say, God, this is not my money, it's your money. Someone asked me one day, why do you give to the homeless? Why do you give to people in need? You know what I tell them? It's not my money. I don't have to worry about that. That's the Lord's business. If he wants to be mad, he can be mad. But my, my, I'm just a tool. I'm just a resource. You know, I didn't want to come here and preach on supporting your partners. You know why? Because when you're generous, partners, that this type of fund becomes irrelevant because there will be such an abundance in the, church's, in the church's budget. I came to say, what if we change the way we give? But maybe this is the first step of, that you're going to take today. Maybe your first step is, okay, maybe I can commit more to the partners. Maybe I can find money places where I've been storing it up. If that's your first step, then take the first step. Trust God. But the reality is, 
You'll never do it if you don't surrender it to him. If you don't say, Lord, this is yours, this belongs to you. And because it belongs to you, Lord, I have no more right and authority over it. Only you have authority. You see, it's really not about the money. It's really about your heart. Because in the, 19th, or in the 21st verse, it says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So it's really not about the money. And what I'm suggesting this morning, why don't you say, Jesus, I want to I surrender my heart to you. I want to surrender my heart because once Jesus gets your heart, guess what else he gets? He naturally gets your money. See, it, it's probably not the 401k that's the problem. Maybe it's your heart. It's not his. Well, if you say that I'm going to radically follow this wonderful passage, I'm going to do it, Jesus, in a way that honors and glorifies you. Keep playing on the piano. I need about two more minutes. <laughs> I told my son Caleb, my son Caleb, you know, he's the guy that's very direct. And so I made him executor of my personal estate. And so I, we, we've been talking about how we're going to do my estate if anything ever happened to me. So let me tell you what I did. I called up Caleb about four days ago. I started wrestling with this passage. And so Caleb, I said, Caleb, how you doing, son? And Caleb is 29. And he said, oh, dad, I'm fine. You know, I said, oh, great. I said, well, I have good news and bad news. He says, what? I said, the good news is I love you so much, and I'll do anything for you. He said, well, dad, please tell me the bad news. I said, the bad news is that you're fired as the executive of my state. <laughs> he said, why are you firing me, Dad? I said, Caleb, when I stand before Jesus, in this passage, it talks about a reward. That was point number three, but I didn't get to point number two. But anyway, <laughs> I said, Caleb, it talks about a reward, that God will honor us with a reward. Remember what Paul said, I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me, but not only to me, but all who are called according to his purpose. Paul's going to get a crown. I said, Caleb, when I stand before Jesus, I don't want everyone to be walking past me to get a crown. I don't want everyone else to be rewarded, and I'd be standing there looking. And I don't think that there will be any guilt or shame in heaven. I just think that we'll know that we missed something. I don't want the Lord to say, you know, this is for those who gave up, gave up everything. And they walked past me. I want Jesus to look me face to face and to say, Ricky, you gave it all up for me. You didn't just leave it in a will just to be passed down to kids. I gave you resources to bless others while you're here. You didn't just give it away, Ricky, you blessed others. But I want that also to be for you, Curtis Lake. And so even as you look at this, if this is your first step, then take it boldly. But it starts in your heart. There's going to be a song that's going to talk about surrendering all to the Lord. And it's going to be talking about new wine. That you want God to, you want God to create an environment where he's, he, he's got new wine in your heart. That God is going to, he's going to do away with the old and he's going to produce this fresh and vibrant wine in your heart. That Curtis Lake, you're not just talking about partners. You'll be saying, are there any other partners we can bless? Your conversation will change. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful morning. And Father, I just, I, I thank you for the, everyone that's here this morning. Jesus, challenge us not just simply to be givers. Challenge us to be vehicles and vessels of generosity that we might give all, not just some to you, but all to you. Give all of our heart, give all of our resources, give everything that we have to you, Father. Empower us to take it to a whole new level. Convict us when we want to lay up. Convict us, Jesus. To you be honor, glory, and praise in your name. Amen. Listen to this song. 
Let it minister to your heart.